Welcome to Maxwell Institute Conversations, special videocast episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast, hosted by Terrell Givens and created in collaboration with Faith Matters Foundation. You can watch this episode in your podcast app, or if you're on the run, listen to the audio version. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God created this extraordinary world, the scriptures tell us, through the power of His Word. It makes all the more sense, then, that a professor of comparative arts and letters like George Handley would spend so much time thinking about and enjoying creation. Handley is the Associate Dean in Brigham Young University's College of Humanities, and he's also the author of several books, including Home Waters and the brand new novel, American Fork. In this conversation, George Handley speaks with Terrell Givens about connecting with the divine through nature about being a good steward of the earth, about the tragic death of his brother and the history of a river. He's consecrated his life and talents to discovering and sharing what is good and beautiful. We do actually have a mandate in our scriptures that tells us to care for life. These are ideas that can get mocked and and turned into cartoons, but they're deeply, deeply sacred and important principles in Mormonism. It's Terrell Givens speaking with George Handley on this episode of Maxwell Institute Conversations, part of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Hello and welcome to another conversation. My name is Terrell Givens and my guest today is George Handley, an old friend and colleague in uh, the area of Mormon studies and literature, literary studies. Um, And uh, happy to have you with us today, George. Oh, thanks, Terrell. I'm honored. Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, about your life as a disciple. I want to talk a little bit about your your fiction, Mm -hmm. uh, your newest book, which hasn't quite been released yet, um, which is American Fork, Mm -hmm. which is a a work of... uh, of real beauty and power. It's a, it's oh, a magnificent thanks. work, and uh, so I'm happy to have had a chance to see that in advance. Uh, you also wrote a kind of memoir, would you call it? Not a memoir so much, but Home, um, home Waters, um, which, in fact, um, I found so appealing in many ways that I asked you to take me fishing so yes. I could experience some of yeah. what you described firsthand, yeah. and uh, we had a, a great a great day. It was an honor to go fishing, fishing with you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was delightful. So in this tapestry of your multicolored life, you referred to these divergent threads and interests, but they all seem to converge on uh, one or a couple of central preoccupations that have largely to do with, uh, with love of the earth, mm-hmm. love of, uh, of creation. Where were the seeds of that first planted? <clears throat> well, I spent uh, some very formative summers in Idaho at the Benyon, Low Benyon's Boys Ranch. Um, my parents sent me there as a camper um, the summer I believe, of 19... Um, now, that wasn't a home for troubled youth. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what he always said. <laughs> I mean, all of us there wondered why our parents sent us there. And and Lowell did take in kids who probably shouldn't have been there. I mean, yeah. I remember every year, and then I was later a, ca- a counselor for him. We always had a handful of kids who were real trouble. Um, yeah. But I, I, you know, being in the wilderness in the West, I was raised in Connecticut, even if I, I left Salt Lake City as a young boy, um, there, there just really was, I mean, you know, going for a three-day backpacking trip in the Tetons at age 12 or 13 just was remarkable. But honestly, I don't, you know, the, the whole sort of environmental stewardship feeling in me, I mean, I had probably everyone's uh, love of nature. I don't think I had any sort of inordinate feeling for it other than the fact that it made me feel holy when I was in a, in a wild place like that. And I grew up on the Long Island Sound and I liked to go swim and fish and, and sail and, and um, all that was great, you know. But I wasn't an extraordinary outdoors kid. My dad didn't take us camping all the time or anything. Um, but, uh, there, there, you know, there were a couple of experience that, the experiences that kind of connected the dots for me over time. And kind of to fast forward a little bit, you know, when I was writing Home Waters and I was drafting it and I was showing it to people to get their feedback, I showed, um, it was pretty much the penultimate draft of the book to a a very good friend and respected writer, uh, Stephen Trimble. And he said, he felt that the chapter that was about my brother's death came too late in the book and that I kind of surprised the reader with it and and it kind of assaulted him and he said you've got to put that right up in the front of the book and I said well I can't do that it's like a house of cards you know I had organized it according seasons and it just it was too complicated to extract it and move it 
but I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll try to put more um, references to his death early. And so in the very first couple of chapters, I talked about him. And, and there's a scene where I'm telling a good friend of mine, John, about the death of my brother. And then he tells me about the suicide of his mother. And <clears throat> when I was writing that book, um, and this is, this is a kind of such a thing that I did not un un anticipate learning about myself. I was describing looking out at the river, and it was one of the last sentences that I wrote in, the, in my last draft of the book, but it was right at the beginning of the book. And I said um, something to the effect of, I can't quote it exactly, but the, the, the whole that he put through his head is the reason I love this river. And, and it was such a strange uh, revelation for me. I remember it just rocked me. I was very emotional as I wrote it. And I thought, I understand why I wrote this book now. And, and what, what's a, sort of an interesting um, side story to that is that I was early on just wanting to write a history of the river. And I had kept a nature journal. And I showed some passages of my nature journal to a poet, Derek Walcott, who I'd been working on as a scholar. And he had come out to BYU for a visit. And, we became good friends, and he wanted to see my writing. And so I, I shared some nature journal writing with him. And the first thing he said was, there's pain in your writing. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, yeah, why is there so much pain in your writing? And I was describing hiking on trails and looking at the river and fishing, and I wasn't saying anything about myself. And I thought he was just romanticizing something. And I actually got really defensive and said, there's nothing in there. I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, well, has anything traumatic ever happened to you? And I said, yeah, I lost my brother to suicide when I was 18 years old. Of course, he jumps all over this and says, you've got to write about this and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know, I have no interest in writing about this. So early on, I think he, and of course I did, mm -hmm. um, but early on, uh, I think he sensed that, that there was something about the way in which nature heals us. And I think it's directly connected to the atonement of Christ. I think it's directly connected to what we read in DNC 88 about Christ is in the light of the sun, he's in the light of the moon, he's the light that quickens our understanding. It, it, there's something about the physical exchange of the senses, you know, and this is very William Blake and Wordsworth and, and all that yeah, too. It's that, also that, very partly Pratt. Uh, yeah, right? I guess. Pratt writes about the atonement as transforming creation okay. as well as man. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you just treat nature as scenery and you treat it as background story to what your your particular human interest and human drama is, and what the social setting is, you're you're missing, um, you know, the cosmological context in in which our human existence gains meaning. And yeah. and so for me, it, it started this um, this journey of self discovery of kind of and not just like in a, again a narrow sense of how do I understand my brother's death, and yeah. it got much much bigger than that. You know, I and and I and I and it was healing for that reason. Um, because loving nature on a profound level helps helps you to feel um, connected to the universe, I guess, and connected to God. You know, there's so. a, there's a there's a there are a couple of those questions in theology that Mormonism hasn't even begun to address yet, and one of them, I think, is is the theology of embodiment. Right? We we talk about well, we we had to come to Earth to acquire a physical body. Yeah. But we're not really sure why, right? We right. have spirit bodies. I'm just wondering. You're just you're suggest what you said is suggestive to me, that there are forces and potencies and kinds of interactions with a natural physical environment that are somehow essential to our our healing, our growth, yeah. our development in ways that we we might not know. Well, yeah, and that that concept that Joseph Smith uh, taught and that has been taught in Mormon. Uh, thought for a long time of, you know, this idea that there's something unique about the combination of the spirit and the body that right. allows us to progress differently than if yeah, we're just in yeah. the spirit um, has always intrigued me. And I think early on, because of Ken, my brother Kenny's experience of his body betraying him, I mean, I believe he died of a disease. I he, believe was, he was depressed. He was mentally ill. Um, I mean, he was depressed, but he was, he was suffering from mental illness. Uh, of, of a pretty serious kind. And then this was before medication was really known or understood very well f um, about such matters. And um, so I think, and I think in my own early teenage um, struggle with my own appetites, um, you know, I think, I think the body, th th when I would read later in college, uh, you know, sort of 
Calvinist or, or, or St. Augustine's views about the body, um, you know, to a certain degree that made sense to me. I'm like, yeah, my body is an enemy and I, and I need to defeat it and strangle it and, and hide it or whatever. But then, but then Mormonism was always telling me something different. Mormonism yeah, was yeah. telling me, no, these, these appetites have to be reined in. They ha they're good uh, or they can be. Uh, they can be used for good if you will learn how to repurpose them and direct them and, and, yeah. and um, shape them. You know, and, and that's part of what I was trying to get at in my book, Learning to Like Life, uh, um, inspired by Lowell Benyon, because, because I think he taught me you can, you can shape your desires. Um, and, and you that's can, what I love about your book. You're talking about a collection of essays that you've done based on Lowell Benyon's mm -hmm. uh, teachings. Many people listening will never have heard the name Lowell Benyon. Yeah. Like Gene England, he's one of the, the greats of our kind of spiritual heritage that are kind of fading from Mormon consciousness. So say, say just a little bit about what you loved and admired about Lowell Benyon and what you're trying to recuperate in this collection of essays you've done. Well, I, L Lowell Benyon was um, a wonderful combination of somebody who was intellect, fully intellectually engaged and fully spiritually engaged. Um, uh, consecrated, you know. I mean, he it's was a hard a, combination. To find. He was a humanitarian to the bone, and he was humble, and would serve gladly any person, um, the most intellectually destitute. Uh, I mean, he he had no arrogance at all about him as an intellect. Um, uh, he was he just he was thoroughly Christian, and and but it was clear to me that part of being a Christian was thinking well and educating yourself, informing yourself about issues, being civically, politically engaged, being um, um, interested in and committed to building your character and serving uh, others and gaining selfless yeah. orientation to, to others. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I came under his influence during this rather tumultuous time, yeah. uh, and so it was, it was really <clears throat> helpful to me. I love, I love the way you boil Christianity down to, in some ways at least, right, the shaping of the desires uh, in conformity with this model of, of Christ. I was just reading today, I think it was John Meyer, who was reading a new translation of the New Testament by David Bentley Hart, and uh, he says, he, he, he repairs the damage done by centuries of mistranslation, he says, because with the introduction of the doctrine of imputed grace and imputed righteousness, he said, we began to read Christ as rescuing us from the burden of Christianity. <laughs> mm. um, uh, and Mormonism has this emphasis on self-transformation aided by Christ's atonement and, and that grace. Yeah. But uh, I really love this notion of, of shaping schooling, yeah. tutoring the desires. And, and to the, uh, I mean, there was something, it was a seemingly meaningless aside, but I remember once Lowell Benyon kind of being dismissive of the idea of journal keeping. And I was a little surprised by that. I said, what's wrong with keeping a journal? And he said, well, nothing inherently wrong with it, but it, your life should not be self-focused. Yeah, yeah. You shouldn't be so self-focused that you feel like you need to narrate and tell yourself everything over and over again. Yeah, you know, yeah. For him, the goal was to lose oneself. And of course, that's you know, yeah. uh, straight out of Christ's mouth uh, that that's what our objective is. So I think that was, um, especially as an adolescent coming into adulthood, that was really important for me to hear. And then he, uh, I tell this um, anecdote in the, in the book, but he wrote me at the end of the summer after I worked for him as a counselor, he sent me my paycheck and he just wrote a note on a piece of paper. He didn't say, hey, George, how you doing? He didn't write a long letter. He just said, keep up your lust for the fine things of life. That's all he said. And, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, lust had always been a bad word to me <laughs> and, and one that caused me some shame because I had plenty of it. And, yeah. I, and I thought, oh, you know, my energy, my hunger. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. I can, I can, but I just Channel need to, it. I just need to, yeah. you know, make sure it's directed in the right way and it can be fruitful for me. Um, so that was, that was really helpful to me. Well, I let's think. talk a little bit about how you've channeled your passion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see in some ways your life is going through a series of stages where you're first sensitized through your exposure to the, to, to the wilderness in a, in a critical vulnerable moment. Um, conditions your love of nature, the tragedy, even though it wasn't working on you in the way you recognized, was mm -hmm. creating a kind of dependency upon or need for the healing effects of nature. Professionally, then, you acquire a degree in literature, but you, you pretty soon move toward echo criticism. Would that be mm -hmm. correct to say yeah. that you're... So, so now you're engaged intellectually mm -hmm. with the world around us as a scholar. Um, 
and then you move into this, the stage of the novelist, mm -hmm. engaging, celebrating, exploring the world around us in, a very, in very specific, concrete ways, not just in some kind of right, detached literary treatment, but uh, a kind of first-hand encounter with the world. And now you've moved on to yet another phase, which is, well, I, I have to actually engage in the world of politics mm -hmm. if we're going to bring all this to any kind of real fruition. Um, so I want to talk, you to talk a little bit about what motivated you to run for city council. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to talk a little bit about how you see the way in which environmentalism is situated in Mormon culture yeah. and in Mormon doctrine. Yeah, which and is, what the tension might right, be between yeah, those two. Two very different things. Um, and I, I want to be careful. I, I don't think... Um, I don't think environmentalism, with the ism being the, the key part of that word, I, I don't think environmentalism is always um, desirable. You know, I mean, I think Good. there... So give us some definitions I here. I think there, there are um, discourses within... Environmentalism, like any uh, large-scale global cultural phenomenon, I mean, it's incredibly diverse. And there are people writing an environmentalist thought today who... Um, you know, have no interest in or commitment to spiritual ideas. Um, on the other hand, we have Pope Francis and lots of other religious leaders who really do have um, a keen interest in spirituality and in Christian doctrine and so on. And of course, uh, figures from other religions um, outside of Christianity who have articulated some really powerful spiritual reasons for caring about the, the physical world and, and attending to its um, health. Um, so, I mean, I've encountered over the years thought that I find inspiring and then other thought I find um, kind of contradictory to what I, what I believe. Um, but I think um, because of some of those issues, um, you know, that there, there has been a, um, a polarization within Mormon culture and most particularly along the Intermountain West. I mean, it's not... A lot of the environmental attitudes you find in the Intermountain West are common among non-Mormons as much as they are among Mormons. So it's not a religious phenomenon so much as it is a regional one. It just so happens yeah. that Mormonism emerges out of this region. Um, of course, it's increasingly a global and international church and community, and that is um, shaping it in different ways as a result. But there's a certain ethos about uh, our relationship to the natural world that you, you can historicize. You can look at how the Mormons arrive here, they see a desert, um, they have an impulse to uh, protect themselves from persecution, to build a civilization uh, apart from uh, the country of the United States and, and sort of have their own independence. And there's this, and Parley P. Pratt's part of that, you know, this kind of relishing of their freedom and yeah. the opportunity to um, settle this area. Um, and then that turns into a kind of impulse to see themselves fulfilling Isaiah's idea of the desert blossoming as a rose and that by working the land, developing the land, um, they are fulfilling God's purposes. And, and I, don't, I don't reject that narrative, um, at least not wholesale, but I do think you know, there's Although a, your main character in your most recent novel does, Harker, right? Yes, yeah. There's a sense that, that, that you know, that we're going to make this desert blossom as the rose, whether it wants to or not, right. kind and, of, right? Yeah, and we're going to turn it all into golf courses and, yeah. and, and uh, so on. Well, I mean, but he's, he's got his finger on something that's a problem, right? Yeah. If, we can't, if we can't appreciate the way in which the natural world is already blossoming as a rose or that it's already providing us right. with bounty, right. it's already giving us sufficient reason to glory in existence um, if we're always looking at it as something that yeah. poor thing needs, it needs, to it be needs improvement, it needs uh, our fixing, um, then I think we've got an ideological impulse that's dangerous, right? I think we've, we've, uh, because we've forgotten what seems to me to be the consistent theme throughout the Book of Mormon and the consistent theme throughout the Old Testament that foundational to our spiritual conversion is understanding ourselves as creatures, as created beings who have dependency on God and, and who need to always, you know, you listen to King Benjamin and Isaiah's really That's, emphatic on There's a tension this. there, right? Because there's such a striving for independence, yeah. not just cultural independence in the Utah period, but I mean, 
right? Joseph Smith saying there are three independent principles in the universe, God, Satan, and man. Yeah. Brigham Young said repeatedly, right, that God's project is to make us as independent in our sphere as mm -hmm. he is in his. So how do you how do you bring these together? I don't know. I mean, I'm still I'm still working on that. I think that's uh, I think that's one of the great um, paradoxes. I mean, you can see it. I'm actually as a as a church leader right now involved in developing and implementing the self reliance uh, uh, services right. initiative in, in in our stake and enjoying it thoroughly and seeing how it's blessing the lives of many people who have have needed to cultivate a greater sense of self reliance and independence. Um, but if you look at the, I mean, and it's, it's tricky how they've used the language there. I'm sure there must have been some debate whether or not self-reliance was the right term yeah. because of its implications. But if you look at doctrinally what they're doing in that program, they're also teaching a, a, a dependence on God, right? A, a yeah. sense of um, spiritual self-reliance is actually an act of acknowledgement that you are insufficient and that you can't do this alone and that you don't need to feel that it was all on your shoulders. So, the, do, you th no, go ahead. so do you think the emphasis on independence, self-reliance, agency, is, is partly to blame for our reluctance to accept the givenness of our environment as a, as a gift and as integral to our spiritual health? Yeah, I think that I think there's some there's some truth to that. I mean, I think it's 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 nuanced, it's complicated, but I think when people become, um, I think it's just a matter of you know again going back to maybe King Benjamin or Isaiah. You know, if, if I'm if I'm reminding myself, if I'm in the practice of reminding myself of my dependence on God and my createdness, my physicality. I mean, this is why the embodiment is so important. Is yeah. it teaches interconnection, interdependence. My body is made up of stuff that isn't me. See, it's, that's, it's that's what earth. I was looking for. There's, yeah. there's, that's moving in the direction yeah. of theology and, and I think of if you, but, but if you look at sort of the American individualist ethos, it, 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 there's no room for that uh, yeah. connection to in, interconnection or so, interdependence. So where do you see the serpent first entering the garden here? At what, at what phase in our history, I'm talking about regional Mormonism, mm. Do you think we we began to go maybe in the wrong direction, um, where we could have been better stewards? Well, I think there's I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, America as a whole really got a little bit drunk with technology and the possibility of progress after World War II, just sort of you know suddenly finding itself at the at the lead of the world as as a democracy and um, you know developing the television and, and the airplane and family recreation and air conditioning and, you know, and then so on and so forth, computers and iPhones. And so there's this great sense that all of this actually liberates us to be more autonomous, more independent, um, and ultimately disconnected from nature, right? Disconnected from the weather. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, my great grandmother's journal mentions the weather every single day, you know. We can go uh, days without even noticing yeah, that it is. Yeah, we don't care anymore and we don't have to. And so we don't we don't have I mean to the degree that my body gets sick and I go to a doctor, then there's concern. But um, and obviously mortality will not in the end let us forget that we're mortal. But but nature is a reminder of our mortality. And so there's actually a reason why we keep it at bay and we don't actually like you, it a whole you're lot. You're speaking in terms of generalities and natural, okay. national technological trends. Yeah. Are you reluctant to point an accusing finger at Mormonism in particular and say, no, A, we should know better, yeah. or B, we have a particular, a particular proclivity to disregard the creation as a sacred thing? Um, is neither of those well, true? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd say, yes, I think it probably is likely that we have a particular See, proclivity. Your, your that problem is, is you have a tendency to be too nice, George. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, but the, the thing that I think is misleading, and I've heard this in Mormon circles, is that, that we're not unique in this regard. So I mean, was wrong? Yeah, our, our culture is, is devastatingly detached from the natural world. Yeah. Modern society is a disaster in that regard, and so we're stuck in that culture, and we're victims of it just as much as anybody else is. Um, I think what's disappointing uh, is that we have, in the process of sort of drinking from that particular uh, fountain of so-called wisdom about individualism and autonomy and so on, is that we've neglected our own doctrine. Uh, which is so extraordinarily exceptional in the Judeo-Christian okay, tradition. Okay, that's what I'm asking. So where's where nothing like our doctrine? Give us well, some good the, examples. Well, the, 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 most, the, the thing that jumps out first and always for me is the idea of a spiritual creation before a physical one. 
Um, there's nothing like that in 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 the Judeo-Christian tradition. So it's certainly not 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 that explicit. I mean, there have been um, theologians who've argued that this is kind of what we ought to think of when we think of the natural world. But there's nothing that states it so explicitly as we have in Moses that says this is, in fact, the reality of the creation, which means plants and animals are living souls. The same phrase, living soul, that is used to describe human beings. That doesn't mean we're exactly the same. We're uniquely created in God's image. But the old debate in Judeo-Christian tradition that environmentalists have engaged in now for 40, uh, 40 years is... Is, is Christianity suitable to an environmental ethic? If you guys walk around thinking that you're created in the image of God and you're totally unique and separate from the rest of the physical world and you were given dominion over it, why should you... That's what gives you license. Why should you feel that it's your concern to preserve a species that might go extinct? But if you say, well, everything has spiritual matter, everything has spiritual identity, everything has a spiritual body... And that body is therefore in some sense eternal and it has inherent value. And God's pronunciation of inherent value uh, in Genesis over and over again, it is good or it is very good, I think implies that there is a kind of deference that is required of us when engaging with our use of the natural world. And you see that so clearly spelled out in Moses, right, where um, Adam and Eve are beholding the tree, right? And, and it, is, it is good and beautiful to look at this tree. And then man saw that it was good for, for food and for raiment. And, and then we in, end up using the natural world. But there's always this implication, as clearly spelled out in DNC 59, that we are supposed to use the natural world um, first and foremost aesthetically. Yeah. I mean, God wants us to take pleasure in it. He wants yeah. us to notice its beauty and its wonder. He wants us to be displaced what I love about disoriented by that. What know? I love about that scripture in 59 is that it points in both directions. It points to us and the fact, as you said, the primacy of the aesthetic and what we should experience. But it also talks about it delight, right? It giveth God joy. Yeah, yeah. To watch us delight. And that, you know, creation. going back to our earlier conversation, I mean, that's that's what I have felt, you know, instinctively when I've been in the natural world and had those powerful um, spiritual experiences or spots of time where I've felt connected to God and I felt his joy. I felt his pleasure in his own creations. Yeah. And, and that's what's so moving to me about the temple as well, is that it reminds me that, that I am a witness to this creation and I am a part of it. And I was invited to be a participant in, in this unfolding of God's like glory. One of the, like one of the sons of the star show yeah. for joy at the yeah. of creation. And, and you know, Nowhere else in Judeo-Christian tradition do you find something like DNC 59 that explicitly states the principles of stewardship, not to excess, neither by extortion, but with judgment, right? Um, you, you're to use the natural resources of the earth. Don't waste flesh, right, in DNC 49. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a certain efficiency and modesty that we're called upon to have in, in our consumption of earth's resources. And then the whole law of consecration spells out the reason for that, because my goal as the, the creator of the world is to feed my children and not feed them physically and spiritually, allow them to flourish. And so as a mandate to take care of the human family, I have to be worried about the, the sources of life that make human life possible, and I have to make that part of my ethic. And you know, as much as all the social issues that circle in, in our society right now that matter a great deal, I find it disheartening that we spend so little time in political context or in church context talking about this. Okay, let me um, ask you this question. You, you say there's, a, there's an exceptionalism to Mormonism insofar as we have it laid out more explicitly, the God's program, the principles of stewardship, theological foundation for a different kind of relationship. To, mm -hmm. to creation. Is there anything on the positive side of the ledger that you can point to where you can say, yeah, as a result, Mormons have been a little bit ahead of the curve here or here? Are there, are there... And with regard to the environment? Yeah. Well, the, the church um, has been very quiet about it, but the church has been very, um, very, a uh, very good steward of its own um, resources. I mean, the church office building is uh, fueled by geothermal energy and has been since it was built. Um, I didn't discover this until a few years ago. Right. Uh, um, it's, it's, uh, it's ranching operations are very, um, 
very sustainable and um, very carefully done, uh, intentionally done in that way. Church architecture is getting more and more green. The, the conference center has native plants on its roof. Um, you know, these aren't, these aren't silver bullets, but they're indications that we have a rich legacy. Of, there's a of, consciousness there. And I think that comes out of our pioneer tradition. I mean, you know, you can point fingers at the pioneers and say, well, they, they over-engineered the, the, the natural world, their natural environment, and, and the desert blossoming as a rose got out of control. But on the other hand, Mormons have always had a, a strong ethic of self-reliance as a community. I think we've lost some of the community, communitarian aspects of self-reliance, and that's maybe where, where we've gone a little bit wrong. Um, I mean, the reason to be self-reliant is to be giving, right? The reason to store food, I didn't know this when I was young. I never heard this when I was young. The reason to store, you know, have food storage when I was young was because nuclear war was going to happen, and that was the only way we were going to survive. And now, you know, I hear as I got older, I heard people saying, well, the real reason you want food storage is because other people are going to need it when things go really badly. And yeah. I thought, well, that's, that, that motivates me, that's actually. That's a better motivation. I don't, I, don't be, I don't want to be a survivalist. I want to be a healer. You know, I want to be the one who's offering my home to people who have been abandoned by uh, civilization because it's, it's broken, right? That's my, that's my objective. And I think if, if you think of our use of natural resources as, a, as an ethic that is motivated towards helping people, then I, it, it, it motivates a kind of modesty in consumption and care and use of resources and concern for future generations. I mean, I guess the reason I was hesitant to sort of point fingers of blame is that I, I think in Utah in particular, it's, it's a really polarized culture. You know, the environmentalists are all pointing fingers at the Mormons for ruining everything. And the Mormons are all pointing fingers at the environmentalists for not believing in freedom and not caring about people. You know? Personal rights. I mean, I'm, I'm creating stereotypes, but those stereotypes are created every day. Yeah. And, you know, name calling and so on and so forth. It's, it's really ugly. And I don't, I don't want to be a part of that. So I don't want to say, oh, yeah, the Mormons have all the responsibility. I mean, Mormons don't work one day out of the week. Um, tell me, show me, show me another community that, that stops, you know, on the whole driving and consuming as much on Sunday as, as we do. That's a pretty major environmental benefit. Yeah. Now, we didn't necessarily do so with that, that intention. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish we would. I wish we would talk about the Sabbath day as a day to remember the creation, that the reason we're resting is because we're recognizing our createdness, the gift of the creation, and that we're stewards of that creation in a, in a beautiful way. And, and instead of just thinking about, um, a, a kind of spiritualized spirituality. I want an, an embodied spirituality that's much more connected to, and we do that sometimes really well. It's connected to my wife and to my children. It's connected to family meals, but isn't it connected to, to where I get my water, where my waste goes, how much pollution I'm emitting from my automobiles or how much I'm not emitting if I choose to walk or bike? I mean, why are these not sort of regular staples of our, our ethic, you know, that we talk about comfortably. I mean, I've been mocked for gathering soda cans at a ward event because I didn't want to throw them away. I wanted to bring them home and recycle them. And I, I mean, you know, I know that there are plenty of people in the church who wouldn't have mocked me for that, but that's silly that that even happens. You know, yeah. it should be a normal daily practice. And the only way that things become daily practices to us is when they're, you know, sociology will tell us, so when they're reinforced at multiple levels, you and I both know, and, and no Mormon in the church doesn't know, that smoking is not good for you and we probably shouldn't smoke. And that's because that message was sent to you a hundred different ways, right? Yeah. And if someone said, oh, and by the way, don't pollute, because it's the same principle. I'm polluting my body and I am polluting your air if I'm smoking near you. So what in the world is wrong with saying we shouldn't pollute? With our, uh, with our businesses, our business practices, or our modes of transportation, how can we, the problem is that becomes political. And this gets to your question. Because at some point, there's only so much I can do as a personal ethic right. to reduce my impact on the earth and maybe kindly invite and motivate other individuals to do the same. But ultimately, policy has to play a role here too. We have to decide as a society that we can act together collectively in the interest of the collective whole. And air quality and its effect on public health is a great example of that. I mean, we're killing people. We're killing people with our air pollution. I mean, that's not even negotiable or debatable. It's, it's, it's fact, right? People are going to the hospital at higher rates during periods of inversion, and they're dying at higher rates. They're yeah. having heart and lung problems at higher rates. People are having asthma at higher rates. 
And we would never justify that on an individual level, but collectively we just turn a blind eye to it. And that's not unique to Mormons. That's, that's my point. But we do have the resources and the doctrinal principles and values to guide us through that and say, well, we, there's a better way than just live and let live or um, you know, live and let die, I guess, and, and survive on my own. There's a way to say, my heart has to be turned toward my children. My heart has to be turned toward the community. And I gotta make sure that human flourishing isn't just my thing, that God isn't just answering my prayers to help me have a job and help me feed my family, but that we're praying and working as a society to feed all families, right. to feed all individuals. So you refer to the fact that we really have to have multiple levels of reinforcement to affect significant change in these kinds of areas. Uh, can you think of a time in your memory when you have heard that kind of reinforcement from higher levels of church leadership? Um, well, yes, I can. Not nearly as many as I would like. Um, uh, Elder Ballard and Elder Nelson have both given talks in general conference in which they've talked about the creation and, and mentioned uh, the importance of stewardship. That wasn't the focus of their talks, but they, they did reference that. Um, Elder, Elder uh, Oaks recently mentioned, I think for the very first time, climate change in a talk he gave in Hawaii. Um, and again, his talk wasn't about climate change, it wasn't about environmental stewardship, but he acknowledged the reality of the problem, the threat it poses to uh, poor people in developing countries uh, who live at, at or below sea level, and um, I thought that was wonderful. So encouraging signs. Yeah, and, and, but the most significant event was Elder Marcus Nash's talk that he gave, not in general conference, but at a symposium at the University of Utah in 2013 or 14, I can't remember, in which he gave, he was asked to deliver a talk representing the church formally uh, to talk about the Mormon view of environmental stewardship. And I had been writing about this subject for close to 15 years, and I was quite nervous sitting in the audience wondering if I was going to discover in the course of his talk that I had been off base or that I was going to get corrected. And um, I was very moved and emotional listening to it because of how beautiful it was. And it's, it's now on, in the Mormon newsroom and on LDS.org. And they do now have a page on gospel topics devoted, or, uh, devoted to conservation and stewardship. And it's marvelous. It's wonderful. It's good to hear. Um, but um, it's not nearly enough. I mean, the, 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 the problem is that you, you can go through the manuals and you can read lessons on the creation, you can read lessons about Adam and Eve, you can read lessons about the law of consecration and doctrine and covenants, and you won't get a lesson with the topic environmental stewardship or stewardship. I mean, stewardship, if you asked, you know, I'm sure if you just sort of quickly polled people in the church, what they think the word stewardship refers to, typically people think of it as a stewardship over money right. and a stewardship over talents, but it's not about, I'm think, re actually responsible for water, air. Uh, do you think part of the problem is, is the feminism problem, that feminism is a label that has been co-opted in some cases by an extreme element that colors the whole in oh, such absolutely. a way that the church yeah. and environmentalism is the same kind yeah. of word? No, absolutely. I mean, this is the, the real irony, is that there has been a movement over the past 40 years with increasing momentum where churches across the world have been arguing for stewardship. I mean, it might not, they might not necessarily use that word, but, but um, it, it is often used. It's certainly used in evangelical and Catholic uh, circles and other Christian circles. Um, so there's a strong religious environmentalism that's out there. It's yeah. global. It's um, arguably one of the most important developments in religion in the last several decades. And you have patri the Patriarch Bartholomew, you have Pope Francis, and, and um, be um, <coughs> before him Benedict and John Paul II um, speaking about this. Um, so there's, there's that. And then at the same time, environmentalism has also its more secular manifestations. And I'm more familiar with those because of my career and my training. And they're not at all interested in religion. And in fact, they see religion as the problem. Right. And so, so that's really where a lot of that comes from. I mean, I was at Stanford University as an undergraduate during the 1980s when the whole population scare was going on. And um, as far as I knew, I mean, this was a kind of naive, superficial understanding of environmentalism at age 22. But, you know, I sort of looked around and I thought, well, environmentalism is about having fewer children. That was as much as I could gather. So I'm not really, I mean, I wasn't intent on having 12 kids. I have four, but, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like it was anybody's right to tell me how many kids I should have. 
And yet I was told almost daily, oh, you're Mormon? Well, I hope you're not going to have more than 2.7 children or whatever yeah. uh, the, it was. But um, So there, there was a stigma attached to, oh, environmentalism means population control. And it was imagined in the worst possible terms, right? It's right. about draconian... A tyrannical government telling you and me, you know, how to, uh, our, what our reproductive rights were or weren't, and and I, you know, like a lot of Mormons, didn't feel invited into that. That was not that was not very encouraging, but I was struck later in life when I got interested in this and and started writing about Mormonism, just how many religious thinkers were thinking in terms of the protection of life is consistent with the protection of the natural world. A sexual ethic itself, which is about guarding reproductive powers because they're sacred and because, because of what they can make possible, seems to me to be the same principle that ought to guide a sense of what the reproductive powers of the earth are. The reproductive powers of the earth are evolutionary and they're de in deep time and they're v incredibly important to everything that we appreciate about the physical world. Everything from the diversity of animals and the beauty of sunsets and the shape of mountains, it's all extraordinarily connected in, in that way. And so if I don't see that I have a similar responsibility to guard the, the capacity of the earth to give birth to life, I've, I've completely missed the boat. I mean, I just feel like that just does not, then, I've, then I, what I've done is I've conserved a certain ethic and a salvational philosophy that is entirely self-centered and self-centering in the human-centered sense. I might care about other people, but I don't care one bit about the June sucker in Utah Lake, or I don't care about, you know, and we, we actually have made fun of the idea of preserving species in our culture as if that's a silly thing to worry about. Now, I, there are political reasons why people resent the Endangered Species Act and the EPA and all these other things, but those shouldn't get in the way of the principles. That's what I find mystifying is that we've allowed political arguments that typically come from a conservative political philosophy to completely block our, our view of the issue and our view of the responsibility, that we do actually have a mandate in our scriptures that tells us to care for life. I mean, in Genesis, God commands the fowls of the air and the fishes in the sea to multiply and replenish and to fill the earth. They got the same we deal we got. We not get in the way of that. I know, exactly. So it, it, what that implies then is that we've got to collaborate. And that's what, that's what dominion and stewardship implies, a kind of collaboration on behalf of the home that we're sharing with the rest of the physical creation, which is also our spiritual family. Right. You know, I, that, that, that sounds, I know, a very tree huggery here. Uh, and, and these are ideas that can get mocked and, and turned into cartoons, but they're deeply, deeply sacred and important principles in Mormonism. And I think they're part of the restoration. I think that's part of what Christianity lost. Yeah. And I think we've got it, but we just haven't taken advantage of it. Isn't it true it. as well, um, going over the Joseph Smith translation recently, I was looking to find what differences are there in the early chapters of Genesis especially. And I note that after the flood, in the aftermath of the flood, Joseph Smith adds that verse about an account will need to be made for all flesh that is mm. killed, mm. the animals. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a striking addition yeah. that in the context of this this mass destruction that has been described, right. that in trying to renew creation, God is specifically pointing yeah. to the natural world and saying, yeah. We're, yeah, we have a stewardship and responsibility and we'll be accountable for the, the needless shedding of blood. Yeah. Of, of, yeah. I think that's, so as you said, that's, that's a unique restoration contribution. Right, right. And it's incredibly uncomfortable to think about, right? I mean, there, yeah. there is no, there's no innocent uh, person anywhere. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the system. I'm part of the society. I, I pollute, I waste, I consume more than I need. Um, and and we all we all have to look look inward and try to figure out some solutions to this. And I you know for me it, the, the solution seemed to be writing and talking about it. And then I kind of got tired of writing and talking only and thought um, and and I should say writing first as a scholar and then as a creative writer. Right. I thought well this creative writing reaches more people. Stories reach people differently than essay or scholarship does. And so I thought I'd, I'd experiment with that. But. But then, too, just getting civically engaged. And, and for me, um, it's such an extraordinary blessing that, that I felt uh, uh, drawn to um, caring about the environment, and, and that brought me into the civic sphere. And that has broadened my sense of my community. It's broadened my and deepened my sense of responsibility as a citizen of a democracy. Um, 
it's very, very inspiring and it's very exciting uh, to get engaged. And it's easy on the, al the alternative is cynicism right. and bitterness, you know, and there's so much of that right now in our society. It's just, it's, it's toxic. Yeah. And all that does is give more room for people to abuse power. So anyway, I, I, I think it's important that, and I think a lot of young people in the church right now, you know, my experience in teaching at BYU is this is... They're receptive to this. This is an issue that they care a lot about, and they should care about it, and they shouldn't be shamed for thinking this is an issue yeah. that, that worries them. No, my, my daughter lets us know if we're not yeah. doing our recycling properly. Right, right. <laughs> um, this, has been, this has been good. Let me, let me wrap this up with a couple of quick questions okay. for you. Um, what are we as a Latter-day Saint people doing well? And it could be within this realm or just more generally. When you think of, of where we are at this moment in our cultural history, what, what makes you proud of the Latter-day Saint people? Um, I think the sense of community uh, that a ward family can produce is extraordinary and exceedingly beautiful and important to our society. That sense of being connected and belonging. I mean, we do berate ourselves a lot about not doing it as well as we should, and there certainly is room for improvement. But precisely because we're trying it, and we're also seeing how we fail at it, and, yeah. and I think some perspective on that is helpful to say, okay, we're failing at it often because that's the nature of the experiment, but, but thank goodness we're in, we're in it. You know, we're trying to build community. And, and manifestations of that are, are pretty concrete. I mean, they're the things that most Mormons know about, right? The, right. the comforting of those who are sick and the visiting of those who are afflicted and, and, and the uplifting of the feeble knees and the strengthening of people through friendship and visits and, and kindnesses. Um, there's a decency and a goodness to, to Mormon people that I, that I think is really, really beautiful. And I think it's grounded in, um, you know, our, our covenants and our, and our commitment to Christ. And I'm very right. happy to, to see that manifested everywhere I turn in a mostly Mormon community where I live. I don't think it's on in short supply. Um, so, yeah, I think well, that's Well, if we had thing. another hour, I would pursue this theme as it's developed in your most recent work on American Fork, mm -hmm. uh, which I think you do in some very subtle and sophisticated ways where you talk about adoption, yeah. community, um, and weave that into a, a, a magnificent account of, of stewardship and love of the earth. Uh, but I'll just leave that as a teaser at this point. Yeah. But what can we be doing better? Um, well, you've... Uh, Have we covered that sufficiently? No, it's something to do with what you were just putting your finger on. I mean, I think, um, I think sometimes we're a little too um, uh, clannish. I think we're a little too... And that's, the, that's a, sometimes a natural byproduct of, say, strong extended family culture, which is a beautiful thing, caring about my cousins and my grandparents and, you know, having that larger sense of family is really important. But it's... Um, you know, I think scripturally we're kind of warned about biological pride or genealogical pride, and that the God is always ancestor syndrome. yeah, God is always willing to disrupt our sense of of what is ours and who we belong to by saying it's actually the stranger I want you to pay particular attention to. So I don't know if we're more phobic about Im illegal immigrants or about um, homosexuals or about um, uh, single people or any any other the thing that doesn't fit a particular mold that we think is is sort of the natural and normal way of of being in our community than other people would be or other f religious communities. I, I haven't lived in those communities, so I don't really know. Right. I just know it's very disappointing when we are unable um, to to not only expressly um, confess our obligation to uh, those who are marginalized, but actually live it. And, and show through our actions that those people, that all people, regardless of their faith, regardless of their circumstances in life, uh, they, are, they are our brothers and sisters. And they need to be, if they, to the degree they want to be in our church um, and sitting by our side, that we have our arms around them and tell them we love them, even if they never want to make any changes in their life at all. Right. Um, that's something, and I know that's, that's utopian in a sense. No, I won't use that word. It's, it's our ideal. Uh, I think it's achievable, but I think um, it is also something with which I feel some patience, knowing that it's hard to grow out of comforts that um, that we've established for ourselves. I mean, I, living in Provo is an extraordinarily comfortable place to, to be, and yet when I travel, I notice my own laziness. 
about how I even look at people who look differently than I do just because I've been in a community where everything's so easy right. and like-minded. And I, and I think um, there's great value in having um, some disruption to that in a, in a productive way so that we're a little more careful about making sure we're not doing what, you know, when Jesus said, you know, we're, it's really the least among you that, that, that I'm going to use as my measure of how, how well you understand who I am. Yeah. How you treat those people is really the key. Yeah. and how you think about the enemy. I wish we prayed for our enemies in church more. I've never, rarely, I guess, heard a prayer in a sacrament meeting for our enemies. And I, and I just think that's, that, was the, that was the pinnacle of what he said a prayer should be. Yeah. It should be that outwardly directed. Last question. Uh, holy envy. Do you have holy envy of any other religious tradition or practice? Uh, I like that question. Um, well, my son and uh, we took my son last year to the Cathedral of the Madeline up in Salt Lake to hear the Madeline Choir sing. And uh, he's a musician. He's a lover of great music, 16, year old, 16 years old. And he turns to me and my wife and he says, I'm so disappointed in our church right now. <laughs> <laughs> so he experienced just a, a tad of, and you know, he, he loves church. He yeah, loves it. Yeah. He's, he's got a great attitude about it. But what he meant was, they real and actually where we live, we, we are gifted with a lot of really great musicians in my ward and in our stake. But, but nevertheless, I mean, the, the attention that had been given to that music in that moment was so beautiful. Um, I kind of pushed back a little bit and said, we, we, we should be very proud of our musical traditions and, and what happens in our, in our church. But um, I've been in those kinds of settings. I've been in Evensong in England um, and listened to the long, drawn-out, beautiful meditation on the Word of God. Um, and I feel like we're, we're um, consumers of Scripture that are we're, we're very utilitarian about the way we read. Yeah. That really bothers me. And I love the way that some other Christian traditions allow the Word of God to be a, a sound and to be a little more of a mystical yeah. Yeah, experience. That, that prayer you hear so often, help us to use these things in our daily life. Yeah. I've always said, I'm, no, not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. We need things to just dwell in us sometimes. Yeah. And I've drawn and drunk heavily from the, the, um, the writers that I love who write about the natural world. I mean, they, they sh have shown me how to be holy, how to experience holiness. I think you put it uh, earlier uh, as a sort of the givenness of things. I mean, I think that's, I learn a lot from poets and great writers about how to, yeah. how to open my eyes and realize that, you know, if nothing else, if everything were taken from me, existence is a gift and I should be grateful for it. And I think um, I envy that because I think sometimes we, we think of holiness as a kind of a, accumulation of things and yeah. an accumulation of blessings or something. And it's, it's the givenness of existence that is the most holy thing, I think. Well, I'm grateful for you coming and joining us today, George. I'm grateful for your, the passion of your commitments and, uh, and for the way in which you've so visibly uh, consecrated your life to, mm. uh, to what is good and beautiful. So thank you for being with us thank today. Thank you, and I'm grateful to you for who you are and what you do. I think you uh, are a great gift, and I appreciate it. Thank you, George. All right.